Hey, Melanie, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm pretty good. I'm on the list for a vaccine shot on Saturday, so I'm feeling very optimistic today. I'm hoping everybody else gets there soon, too. Oh, good, good, because we need you, Melanie. We really do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you what an honor this is because you've delighted me since I was a little boy, and I just thank you for oh. making this finally happen today. Yes, it's been a long time since we've gotten to speak. Thank you for persisting. And, um, you know, especially now since I've written my first book and it's coming out in a couple of weeks, so I'm excited and nervous. And it'll be great to have a conversation with you about it. Pers persistence is the key to success, I say. And yeah, let's let's start with your book, Odd Woman Out, which, by the way, I love that title. It pretty much sums up everybody in show business, you know. That's what John Goodman said about it. He said, we're all a little odd, you know, in this business. So, yeah. But I think everybody feels odd from time to time. We feel left out or third wheel or that we don't fit in. I, I think it's true just about everybody. So I'm hoping, of course, everybody will buy the book that feels odd. Yeah. What, so what made you write the book? Uh, well, I had been um, performing these stories in different modes for a few years. They were all kind of extraordinary, unique things that happened to me over my 50 years as an actor and person who was in the midst of showbiz looking for true love, and it was very hard to find. And um, I had done this show. I was commissioned by the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival to do a, a one-woman show. Mm -hmm. so I did a one-woman musical memoir for them in which a lot of these rudimentary stories were included. And then I also uh, asked to perform them in different other shows, uh, reviews done at different theaters. And then I did them at Comedy Central when asked. I did uh, different pieces. Comedy Central had a show called Sit and Spin in which writers mm -hmm. would, uh, you know, be filmed doing uh, one story of about 11 minutes long yeah. uh, every once in a while. So I did that show a number of times. And then um, they were filmed, and then one time a, a literary agent came and saw me in it, and she said, you are writing a book. This is literary. This is, um, this is more than just a, a stand-up act. And she was right, and she got me started, and that was about two years ago. It took me about a, a year to write the book and then about six months to sell it. And so just before pandemic, I got a deal, and um, luckily I had this to work on while while we were all locking down here in Los Angeles. So, um, and here it is. It's about to be born. Yeah. Uh, so it took a year to write? Yes. When I actually started putting all the pieces together and deciding in what order they might go, uh, had an editor's help. She was very smart about um, the Aristotelian catharsis and all. I'm not sure if you lay people know what that means, but it means... Uh, there being a payoff, a kind of a relief, you know, a lot of tension builds and builds, a lot of suspense. And then right. at a certain point near the end of your film or your book or your television series, there's a turning point. And then after that, it's a, it's a change. The character has changed. So um, that's what we determined to do in the order of the book. It's pretty chronological. Some uh, sections of it are essays in which I reflect back in time about certain essays. Uh, you know, issues that my mind changed about as time went by. Certainly, yeah. I was um, growing up in an era where suddenly going from provincial prudery in New England, where I was born, I was moving into New York, where everybody was on the pill, and it was free love in the 70s, and a very liberal attitude, and feminism, and so suddenly all the, the old morals of my youth seemed uptight and prudish. But it took me a while emotionally to catch up with all those changes um, and get hip with the times. <laughs> I stayed innocent very a very long time. I was very scared of losing control or, or what might happen. You know, if I yeah. truly fell all in love and, and truly, uh, you know, decided to have a child, it, it was just not in the cards for me. I knew I wasn't mature enough. I didn't really know who I was. I was very good at playing other people, but not good at playing my, myself. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there were just a lot of changes me and a lot of women in my era went through, and they might recognize themselves in this book. Uh, I think a lot of young women will see the mistakes that they might make and, and turn the other way when they see the stupid things that I did in relationships. Uh, 
um, over those years. I sort of satirized myself, and, and it comes off funny, but I think there's a lot of lessons in the book for codependents and people who are addicted to other people, uh, as I was for a while, getting people's approval, uh, yeah. getting their protection. That was all very important to me. So I think I cover a lot of those sorts of subliminal feelings. It's pretty intimate in parts, uh, the book where I take people inside my thinking and thinking about how crazy my thinking seemed. So I think it's educational in a way. Oh. And I think it will give um, singles of any age hope that they that it's never too late to learn to love, you know, yourself and another person too. It's never too late. There are lessons to be learned until you drop. Yeah. I think okay. that's what people take away. Yeah, codependency is a big issue in my family. I was watching uh, your Zoom interview with Sandy Weiner the other day, and I could relate. Yeah. I could relate to a lot of what you said about trying to figure out who you were and um, manipulating men. I was a I was a nightclub bouncer for years, and after a while, I was only doing the job because of the one night stands. And I just, I, I in hindsight, you know, I realized I had a problem, you know, and it's a yeah. very common human aspect of life i i feel i think it's it's universal everyone has uh, addictions like that yeah and you were a bouncer so you certainly got a big cross-section of addicted society yeah a <laughs> big time i mean substances and substances as people um there's just a lot of that going on and when there's a drink and there's dancing and there's interplay between the genders it's a very tempting Oh, yeah. I just went through all of that stuff. And I also mm. related to how um, your mother had jealousy issues with you. Mine does a little bit as well. And um, she's mm. she's uh, been slowly um, get, uh, getting over it. You know, um, ever since I came back from my car accident and I started my podcast, she's oh, been, what happened? been working on it. I had a car accident six years ago. It was a pretty bad thing. Um, I fell I fell asleep in the passenger seat. Uh, the guy I was with fell asleep at the wheel. We ended up in the middle of the road and then got hit when we got out. And I was in a coma for 30 days. Oh, my God. That's awful. I'm so sorry. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. Well, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I wouldn't be talking to you right now because... I be, I had to I had to go through that in order to get sober for six years. It'll be next week is the one year anniversary as the six year anniversary of it. Next Thursday. Happy birthday! That's quite a birthday to celebrate. I know how hard that is. I have a lot of friends that are in sobriety now, but every day is, is a challenge for them. And you're to be congratulated for your self discipline. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. I've been very proud of it. I'm I'm in the middle of writing my first book uh, about how much I love cult films, and I talk uh, about uh, that stuff, and I talk about you know what each movie means to me that I that I just I grew up watching and stuff, and yeah, it's been it's been quite a ride the last six years. Mm, well, welcome to the world. Thank you. <laughs> welcome out. <laughs> <laughs> I love the uh, the review the review blurb that Ann Beats wrote that she wishes she had wrote this book except for the dirty bits. <laughs> <laughs> I know that was a, an honor in a way. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 they're not dirty; they're just honest. Let's face it. If you read it, I want to let you know that it is not titillating or dirty, or but it is racy. It's not vulgar, but it is a little racy. That's just a a warning in advance. I'd say PG sixteen. Oh, I'm not offended by any means of, of any raunchy humor. I did stand up for 10 years, so I know <laughs> all mm. the humor. Yeah. Yeah, stand up's a tough road. I did it for a while, too. It's a tough road. I know. I wanted to ask you about that. Like, what made you get into stand up? Well, I was doing a, a Broadway show, a Moliere play with the young Vic, and um, I was asked to audition for the new Latin that George Slaughter was doing, and this is in the 70s, mm -hmm. and he was casting for talent in New York, and so my agent at William Morris said, can you throw a few of your songs together? I wrote comedy songs. I still use them from time to time, mm -hmm. um, and go on at the Improv Club, and I did, and um, I didn't get that job. He gave me a lot of encouragement, 
but I was encouraged to keep doing it. Bud Friedman really liked having a, a you know, a girl amongst all the tough guys and gals who were starting out in stand-up. And he liked the musical element. So I continued. I continued to hone it for years. I would moonlight after, you know, this Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And then later when I first started coming out here, um, Bud Friedman said, go on at the L.A. Club. I'm out here now. So my first night in L.A. I started, and I did it for the next two or three years until I was... Um, asked to audition for this television show, which was a late-night comedy clone of Saturday Night Live called Fridays. Fridays. <laughs> and when I got that job, I sort of put improv, the improv clubs behind me, except to go and visit from time to time and see other people. I didn't think I was that great a joke writer, frankly. My characters were very funny. Um, but, you know, Fridays brought me into a whole other echelon, and um, I, I thought to myself, I didn't really enjoy hanging out with alcoholic people oh. after my shows and there was a sort of a strange element it was a very competitive scene and you know you had to stay up till two in the morning sometimes you know to get a good slot to get a cl I usually open or close sometimes after Robin Williams which was one of the most difficult positions I've ever been in <laughs> the audience was so exhausted from laughing at him that sometimes I just get some of their leftover laughs but they were tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was a hard slot. But usually I'd open with a, with a band. I had a band. And at a certain point, I was singing a really happy rock and roll song. Then I'd say, wait a minute, that's not true. That's not true. And then I'd dismiss the band and then just tell piteous stories, you know, from these different characters' points of view. Um, so then I just didn't do it anymore after that. I was more interested in being a good actor. And I went back to studying... Uh, uh, with a wonderful teacher here. I had studied with Stella Adler in New York. Mm -hmm. It was very anti-Stanislavski anti method. She didn't see that Stanislavski had a method. He had exercises that he did to sensitize people. But in preparing for roles, she advised not using any method, just communing with the story. And I found a gentleman out here, a wonderful teacher named Harry Master George. Mm -hmm. I continued to tune in with him every couple of years when I can't he coaches me sometimes for auditions he is the real deal he doesn't advertise but many people have come through his classes from Brian Cranston Ray Liotta Daryl Hannah wow uh, I had a lot of wonderful classmates uh, to work with it was a very high caliber class wow. and I um I tend to have a very intellectual approach to Things like improv, kind of. I did a lot of improv. I still teach improv. Mm -hmm. um, I teach it as a therapeutic tool, however, more than a performance tool. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, improv kind of puts you in a director and writer's frame of mind as well as a performer frame of mind. And in this class taught by Harry Master George, he wants your head completely out of it. He wants you to be the, the character and listen to the director. Mm -hmm. and not have any points of view on how it looks or how it comes across, which improv, you know, forces. You have to constantly be aware of how it's coming across. Are they following? How do I introduce the next section? But as an actor, it's just me becoming someone else, and that feels very pure to me. I sometimes have disappeared into roles and woken up at the end of the play, having had such a rich experience that, I was gone, you know, for the two hours of the play. That, that's my favorite. It's like a drug trip. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's, it's so, w so your whole act was, um, do, was doing characters and songs? Mostly doing characters and songs uh, with patter between. The patter got bigger after a while. Um, but a lot of it had to do with making the transition, as many of my colleagues were at that time in the late 70s, moving from New York to Los Angeles, and until so many of us became bicoastal, the contrast between New York energy and L.A. energy was very vivid, very clear. So a lot of us were doing stuff about the differences we were experiencing. L.A. just seemed like everybody was so beautiful, and everybody was happy and calm, and the weather was so gorgeous, as opposed to life in New York, where we had severe winters. Yeah. And people were black, and... Um, People were self-defensive on subways and public transportation. They weren't warm and friendly, cruising around in their cars, isolated as we were here in Los Angeles. So there was a lot of contrast. A lot of us went through that. I know that some of Larry David's early material was about 
being a New Yorker, and then it transitioned into living here, and now it's just a big schmear of bi-coastal mess. <laughs> yeah. Both cities, at some level, seem to have merged in terms of our artist energy anyway. Um, if you can afford to live in both places, it was a great privilege to have. You know, I went back often because I missed the theater and I wanted to see my mom. Mm -hmm. um, I went back often uh, and I had a little crummy apartment there and had a little crummy apartment here in Los Angeles. And both places balanced me out, you know, my particular complexity and hunger. And I did a play there, and then I'd come back and do some television here. It felt really like a great balance for a while. Wow. It, did you... Yeah, it was the ideal. Yeah, I mean, that was a magical, revolutionary time for comedy. Uh, um, you know, N New York, I mean, there was Catch a Rising Star. Did you g go there a lot? I did, although I was not as much of a monologist as kind of a musical theater review kind of performer as I did music and stuff. And Rick Newman, he liked me, and I had my five minutes of television-type material that I might get to do on a talk show. But he didn't have a pianist. He didn't have really room for musicians. So I tend to just stick close to the improv. Yeah. When you when you moved to L.A., did you uh, perform at the Comedy Store? I did a couple times. I was one of the first female performers in the belly room, which Mitzi opened, uh, yep. Give Women a Voice. Um, the belly room continued for quite a long time. Um, but I didn't go on that often. I really found that my true, truer love was acting. And that was what I wanted to pursue. I wanted to be on dramatic shows and comedy shows. I wanted to do it all. And I got to do a lot of it so far. Right now we're all in shutdown, so I'm doing Zoom plays. Yeah. And then inter interviews with guys like you, which is great, to break up the isolation of the day. Oh. And um, so I hope to do an Internet series or something when things uh, when things pick up a little. We're in lockdown here in L.A. It's been very scary. Uh, yeah. A lot of people are catching it, having no idea where they got it. So I've just been sort of shut in my house and see my husband every evening, which has been a great consolation. Um, but um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty not much with everyone else. We don't know what's next. We don't really know what's next in our business. It's radically changed. I know. I was... Uh, I was um... I, I was going to shoot a pilot for my own horror movie show that I was um, independently uh, making, and uh, it got delayed for the second time last year. Mm. Um, oh. I, I uh, got offered a movie role two years ago, and I uh, was waiting for the financing of it, and that got shelved. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's insane, mm. you know, but I, I think by next year, early next year, we should be okay. I certainly hope so. I miss other actors and other people altogether. There's a, a good story. Oh, sorry. I have so many un. That's all right. I have so many unhugged hugs in my heart. I mean, I just yeah. hope hugging does go out of out of uh, fashion uh, um, because I just there's so many people I miss hugging. Um, I want to hold them and smell their hair and look into their eyes and cry. I mean, you know, I just am hungry. I think we all are for that kind of contact again. So I hope we'll be allowed to do that, that when everyone has hopefully gotten herd immunity. Um, and I, I'm hoping, I'm, yes, I think a year from now, as you say, things may have, have eased in terms of our paranoia on contact and stuff. Yeah, I miss hugging people too. You know, it's like we're living in a, a Twilight Zone episode or a uh, a Doctor Seuss story waiting to happen or something. <laughs> it's just yeah. it's weird. Yeah. I remember a, a, a story you told in, in an interview once where you said you were doing a play and there was a stage malfunction and everyone got hurt. Well, um, a lot of us didn't get that hurt, but some really did get hurt. That, that's in, in my book. It's called uh, Via Galactica, Road to the Stars. It was yeah. my first Broadway show, and unlike the whimsical, you know, ingenue and juvenile musical theater of my history, this was a cutting-edge, bleeding-edge rock opera, science fiction rock opera, starring Raul Julia. Uh, it was opening the brand-new Eurus Theater, which was the first new Broadway house in 100 years. Uh, this is in 1972. Mm -hmm. I had just, just gotten out of college, and I was so fortunate to get into this show. We had a British director named Peter Hall, who became Sir Peter Hall a few years later, huh. uh, the director of the National Theater. 
and he's the father. He was, he's the late father of Rebecca Hall, who's become quite a renowned actress. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, the technology just dwarfed us. It was bigger than the story. And on a preview night, we were trying out the equipment, and we climbed onto this kind of uh, fire escape staircase that was going into the underside of an enormous rocket ship, which we had built to escape the Earthlings who were coming to kidnap us. Yeah. And as the uh, the orchestra for the first time was playing this wonderful anthem called New, Sh- New Jerusalem Shall Rise, which is about a, f- a f- place that we all could go, all us independent revolutionaries, uh, the winch is pulled out of the ceiling and this entire fire escape mechanism with 40 people on it fell through the stage, crashed, fell through the stage, and then fell over in the bowels of the theater. And people were screaming and crying. I think I was unconscious for a few minutes. But fortunately, I had only gotten bruised hands from grabbing onto the banisters. Um, but there were children on it, like little Ralph Carter, who was a, became a sitcom star. Shortly after that, he fled to L.A. Huh. Uh, and a, couple of, a lot of us left the show, walked out. Uh, some of us stayed, who were ambulatory. I had a cane uh, for the rest of the run, which was not long. I think the show only ran two weeks it, had some big houses because it was a curiosity. <laughs> people wanted to understand what was this thing. The equipment was tested. There were fewer people on this staircase thereafter, so that never happened again. But it was kind of like what you heard about Spider-Man, the musical, that had its kind of opening on Broadway a number of years ago, and there were a lot of accidents, and people dropped who were flying in this, in the, across the stage were dropped. There were a lot of injuries. So to me, it was very disheartening because I had so loved Broadway because it was so alive. And to be part of something that was so technological was not my feeling of Broadway. Luckily, I did get to do another Broadway show after that, which redeemed Broadway for me. Um, <laughs> oh, and I just missed the idea of Broadway. I just hope it, it gets to open again in a couple of years and make these wonderful actors get back to work. Yeah, I interviewed an actress once. She she was doing a Broadway show, and there was a malfunction like that. And she she I think she got cut or something. And she said that Michael yeah. Jacks Michael Jackson was in the audience, and like um, they ironically like a year later did a did a um, did a Broadway thing together. I just thought that was hilarious. That you know he, oh, he had to see the. Yeah, he had to he had to see the malfunction happen, and then you know that led to a a, a job with him a year later. I thought that was pretty cool. Cool. Yeah. Yes, well, that didn't happen to most of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember when you guest starred on Wonder Woman. Oh, that was so much fun! Yeah. I was supposed to be in Jeopardy, but I was so thrilled to be working with you know with Linda Carter. And Henry Gibson from Laughing was on my episode, and Rick Springfield played my boyfriend. It was very hard for me to play the tragedy of my role as a kidnapped Olympic athlete, based on Nadja Komenich, by the way. Um, <laughs> that was such a good time because they had a stunt woman double for me, and I would just pretend to be jumping off trapezes or off a, a one of those, you know, leather horses, and she would spin through the air, and then I would just land, and they would you know, bring the camera up on me, and it looked like I was like an athlete. Mm-hmm. A gym, a gymnast, which of course I wasn't, but yes, that was great fun. It was great fun. And we just lost the... Uh, oh. That was one of the first things I did out here, start interrupt. Oh, it's okay. We just lost Lyle Wagner. Did you interact with him? He never did, but of course I was such a fan of Carol Burnett and her ensemble. I did work with Tim Conway a lot. We did voiceovers together. Yeah. And I were born born the same day, so we had that in common, and that was our conversation piece. But no, I was never close with him or any of the cast members on, on Carol Burnett. I just admired them. And she I worked with in uh, a show called Fresno. It was a miniseries. Yeah. It was a parody of Dallas. And she played the matriarch of the family, and I played her son's lawyer. So we got to hang out on set. And Fresno, which wasn't a very big hit here, although it was in, in, in London, um, was uh, full of stars like Terry Garr, the beautiful Terry Garr. Chuck Groden was in it. Dabney Gre- Coleman. Gregory Harrison. Uh, he was, like, walking around without Gregory his shirt. Ha- yes, yeah. that's right, walking around with no shirt. Yeah. Old thing. <laughs> 
Billy Paxton, the late Billy Paxton, who's oh, such a doll, yeah. so wonderful. And um, it, was, it was star-studded, and again, a lot of the fun was hanging out with folks between shots as well as the shots. I, I can't tell you how funny that show was to me, and I was so surprised that they put a laugh track on it, which made it weaker, I felt. I thought it should be presented just like Dallas. Mm, uh, although yeah. it was about the raisin industry, uh, <laughs> you know, which is kind of comical in itself. Don't ask me why. It just is. Raisins are funny. <laughs> and um, the murder mystery was that someone prominent in Fresno had been dehydrated and boxed <laughs> with other raisins. <laughs> and so I was one of the uh, attorneys called in to help solve this mystery. And I was just an over-the-top character called Desiree de Mornay. I cared more about how I looked uh, in front of the jury than I did about my case. It was just a very vain and kind of narcissistic performance. Mm -hmm. I was always late to court because I was getting my nails done or some complaint like that. It was a very comical role. And I think in a way that prepared me to do this role called Miss Musso on a show called Parker Lewis, Lewis can't Lewis. Lose. on Fox. <laughs> yeah. I'll be prepared. Oh, yeah. I watch Parker Lewis all the time. Um, do, you have, mm. do you have a favorite episode? Oh, wow. God, there were so many wonderful episodes. Um, I guess there was one where I sang a duet with John Panette. Oh, yeah. Late John Panette. God, I hate <laughs> saying the late. I'm saying the late an awful lot tonight, today with you. Um <laughs> There was a musical that we did. He was in love with Miss Lusso, and he had a fantasy pas de deux and duet with her. And I think that's up on YouTube. And that was great fun, because I got to do my musical comedy thing. You know, my dancing and my singing and my shtick. Yeah. Um, but generally, I, I had a little bit to do in every episode, and it was always delicious. And I love working with Corky Nemec, Corin Nemec, mm -hmm. and Dilly Jane, and... Uh, and Abe Ben Ruby, what oh, a yeah. doll he was. Um, and I was the only woman, grown up woman, regular on the show, so I got a lot of attention from the boys, and that was a lot of fun. Um, they treated me well. It was a very healthy show, as opposed to other shows and musicals I've done that didn't feel like a healthy or safe kind of production. But Parker Lewis was all around a very good time. I was very sorry when it ended. Yeah, I was supposed to interview the, the little sister, Maya Bruton, soon. Oh, sure, Maya. I forgot about her. She was fantastic. She's an attorney now. Yes, she is. In New York. Yeah. Yes. I remember about t 10 okay. years after I did the show, I was, no, not 10 years, maybe five years after I did the show, I was in New Haven, my home, hometown, mm. and I went to see a play at Yale, and she was the usher. Really? Oh, Maya, what are you doing here? And she was majoring in law and becoming quite the young woman, very strong and assertive young woman. But it was just wonderful to see her again in any context. I was really proud of her. Oh, yeah. Tell her I said hi, please. I sure will. I sure will. Yeah, there, there, uh, there was an episode I remember where Miss Musso is dating a character that Garrett Graham played. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember that one. I thought that was a pretty funny episode. That was very sent up, and, and he was wonderful to work with. Our, I think we did a few episodes full of romantic tension together, and um, that was always a blast. It was very over the top, I have to say. And sometimes it really was it strained credulity. It was really very far over the top. I remember when Miss Musso's mother came to visit, and her brother came to visit her at the school, and it was Mrs. Cleaver and the Beef. <laughs> and I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. You guys, you know, they just wanted to have a good time and frustrate me, I guess. But it was nice to meet, you know, the beef yeah. and um, and Mrs. and Mrs. Cleaver. They were just lovely. So, I, what can I say? I've been very lucky. It's been a, you know, it's so far it's been a great trip, varied and interesting, and I've gotten to work with some of the most talented people in the world. Yes. Oh, my God. You know, one of my favorite movies since childhood is Stooge Mania. Oh, no, really? Yes. Oh. oh. <laughs> yes, I hit myself with a pie in that, in that film. Yeah. But yes, that was the first time I think they had uh, merged live footage of the Stooges with a, a contemporary storyline. 
Yeah. Um, my dad and I are huge Three Stooges fans. It's been passed on down from my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather and my dad used to watch it all the time. And then uh, my dad and I, to this day, whenever we get together, we still watch the Three Stooges. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I just love the movie. Jo you and Josh Mostel's chemistry is so great. Well, that's because we were in group therapy in New York together for three years. Mm -hmm. And there was a rule in group therapy that you could not fraternize outside of the therapy group. Huh. So when I was on the set with Josh, I refused to talk to him, you know, like, <laughs> uh, except in what we had to do on the set. And one day he knocked on my trailer door and I said, yes, what is it? And he said, you know, it's been six years since we've been in that therapy group. I think the statute of limitations has run out. I said, yay! So I gave him a big hug and <laughs> we were able to talk after that. <laughs> But, yeah, we knew each other really well from therapy. Wow. When you guys were reenacting the classic Stooge short Brideless Groom with the wedding at the um, yes. City Hall, yes. did you all go home with bruises and sore limbs at the end of the day? No, I didn't. I didn't take that many chances with myself. I'm very self-protective. <laughs> um, no, I don't know who did. I think it was all quite playful, and there were stunt people, so I don't think anybody really got hurt on that one. We all knew how to how to move and how to protect ourselves, as opposed to Via Galactica, the musical where everybody was taken by surprise and had no had no preparation for this disaster. There was nothing we could have done. It was just a complete accident. I think on Stooge Mania, we were all staged. And I've been in a lot of staged fights. There was only one that went, went really wrong. Mm -hmm. And that was with Mary Edith Burrell on Friday. I don't know if you saw that. It's on YouTube also. But we were playing a violent family mm -hmm. where instead of talking, people just haul off and suck each other, you know, when they're mad. Yeah. So I was playing the elder matriarch. You know, I was in a white wig and I had little, you know, spinster shoes and stuff. And... Uh, I was offering to help her. Oh, let me help you with the dishes, dear. I'm not too old to help you. And she kept saying, Ma, leave me alone. Leave me alone. And then I got, you know, into this sink and was trying. And then she socks me. Now, of course, she's supposed to miss me by an inch. And then I was supposed to fall onto this mat, <laughs> pull myself right up. But in her zeal to get it right on live television, she connected and she hit one side of my jaw. That side of the jaw went into the other side and a tooth broke off. And then I Ooh. tried to follow the blocking after that where I fell to the mat, facing Ooh. down. And so when she came to pick me up off the ground and said, Mom, you know, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't bother me when I'm washing the dishes. And I looked her in the eyes and I said, well, you shouldn't be so rough on your mother. <laughs> you could get hurt, you know. And I was bleeding and she looked terrified. She looked so upset. She was really troubled that this had happened. So I had to go through the rest of the live show, you know, bleeding, sucking down the blood. And then, of course, they gave me a better-than-ever tooth. But it was kind of maddening because they, they uh, Bob Urich was on Entertainment Tonight, and they showed a replay of the fight in slow-mo, which mm -hmm. looks awful. And uh, he said, I was in the wrong because I didn't make eye contact with Mary Edith during the staged fight. But this wasn't a fight. This was me washing the dishes, and she stopped me. So I was very mad at Bob Urich for making me look wrong in this scenario. There was no wrong. It was just a mistake. And... Mm -hmm. um, uh, we didn't stage the fight that way with me looking at her. So, in my own defense, wow, I just had to say that. Yeah, because I, I also talked to Mark Holton, who played the guy who thinks he's curly in the movie, and he told oh, yeah. me. He told me during the pie fight at graduation, uh, a girl got cut in the face. Do you remember that? I do, do not. I don't think I was told about it. Yeah, um, the director told uh, this guy to go throw a pie in this girl's face, and he forgot to take it out of the uh, the pie tin. It had sharp edges, and it cut her face. <gasps> yeah. Oh. oh, that's horrible. No, yeah. you don't use a, a tin with a pie fight. You just use a handful of, like, crust with whipped cream in it. I mean, that's... We all know that. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Yeah. But I did have one experience in which I hurt myself pretty badly. Um, my husband and I got married a few years ago. We decided we would travel internationally every year. We haven't gotten to do it, of course, this year. Mm -hmm. but we went to Greece. And um, the final night of our tour, we were taken to this very traditional Greek restaurant where they had the guys dancing and playing the balilaika and teaching us to dance. And they were breaking these plates over their heads. And I'm sorry, not 
over their heads, but on their hips, on their feet, on their knees. And so since I had been in a lot of stage fright, like in cowboy movies and stuff, I yeah. knew that when they had plates and dishware and bottles, there were always this breakaway stuff. It was like a sugar glass, so that the minute you knocked it against something, it would just splinter into pieces like real glass. So I went up first. Uh, to do the dance uh, when invited. They invited everybody up one by one to do the dance. And I went up, and smart-ass that I was, <laughs> I grabbed one of these plates, and thinking it was breakaway glass, I cracked it on my head. Oh. And it broke, and everybody cheered. It was hilarious. And then uh, it was the next person's turn. And then I felt like I was perspiring really heavily, so I walked back to my husband at our table, and I said, am I sweating? And he screamed, because I had blood like pouring down my <laughs> so he rushed me down to the restroom where there was a woman coming out of the stall who nearly fainted when she saw me, but she helped mop me up. And for some reason, it wasn't that injurious. It was just bloody. It was uh, just a place on your head that has a vein. <laughs> and um, and then Stanton, you better come upstairs quick because people are imitating you. So I ran upstairs with a bandage on with with a piece of toilet paper clamped to my head, and I said, "Please don't do it. Don't." and other people were doing it and they didn't get hurt. But then they all said, sing a song, Melanie, sing a song for us with the band. And I had to demure because I was still holding like this bloody, you know, toilet paper on my head. Yeah. So that was one time when a stunt didn't go so well. Wow. Yeah, I've talked to female stunt performers and they've had it all, you know, uh, broken fingers, you know, broken toes, mm. everything. And I just I just can't believe that they just go out there and still doing it until they're 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 ready not to do it no more. You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I think there's a real thrill to that profession. The the daredevil nature of these people, these women and men. They love the thrill of accomplishing it. Um I've known some stunt women too. They're first of all, they're incredible athletes. They yeah. are working out all the time, and um, they love becoming somebody else and doing these, you know, falls off of cliffs and jumps off of cars, and they just really get a thrill out of it. It's their addiction. Mm -hmm, it is. Yeah. It, it, um, when you were on Fridays, didn't uh, Michael Richards and Andy Kaufman get into a fight on the show? Well, it wasn't real. It was all an improv, actually. Uh, <laughs> we were told before the uh, beginning of the show that night that Andy was going to kind of blow through everything. He was not going to be cooperative, and we should just improvise and stay in character. So I always knew something was up with our last sketch of the evening because it was, didn't have an ending. It didn't have a written ending. So um, as Andy started rebelling against the material, uh, we all you know, went with it. And then it escalated. We were told to improvise, and I got more violent. And um, Michael threw the cue cards at Andy like he didn't know his lines. And Andy threw water in Michael's face or something. And then the crew, which was not in on the joke, leapt onto the stage to defend us. Their faces were all red. And then, of course, they cut, you know, they cut to commercial. So it was like a train wreck, and, and it got us a lot of press. It was the highest rating we had. <laughs> ever gotten for a show because Andy was on and then more and more people tuned in when they heard that he was kind of violating and breaking the fourth wall and saying oh this scene is terrible and, yeah. <laughs> and then it was later immortalized in a, a film about Andy called Man on the Moon Jim Carrey I was played by Carolyn Ray I was played by Carolyn Ray the lovely Carolyn Ray yeah. uh, and Michael was played by someone else as well we were told we were too old at that point to play ourselves which was very hurtful but oh. uh, that's that's the business. But but Danny DeVito, so, um, but, but Danny DeVito's in it. <laughs> Danny DeVito's in what? He's in Man on the Moon. Oh, was he? Oh, he played my my friend George Shapiro. He played Andy's manager. Yeah, <laughs> just it's yeah. So, it's so crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you think Did you think it was an accurate description of, of Andy Kaufman? Well, I thought it was a great impersonation. I thought Jim did a great job. It was almost like he went too far with the obsessive nature of Andy. It was almost like it took him over. Yeah. I know, just like when um, uh, Faye Dunaway played uh, Mommy Dearest, Joan Crawford. Oh, really? Yeah. She got carried away? Yeah, she got carried away. She was in character all the time, a uh, few people have told me, and she was just very unpleasant to work with on that set. Oh, how, how sad to hear. 
Yeah. Well, I guess she's a talented. We must be careful not to get taken over too much by one's wolves. There has to be five percent of you that stays out that knows you're someone else. Yeah. It depends like, on the role. Like in some roles, like when I do comedy roles, I'm maybe seventy percent immersed because I have one eye on the timing, uh, on the uh, audience, on the way it's coming across. That's my directing nature. But in drama, I totally immerse and disappear. But there's always like 10% of you that's outside the immersion because you have to know where where your light is, where you stand, uh, the blocking, uh, how to bow to the audience at the end. If you're too immersed, you can't bow to the audience. <laughs> in, film and tell, in film, it's much easier to go much more deeply because you are locked up for a month with only that role, not much outside life. You're usually on a location that puts you more into the story. Um, and I think film actors like De Niro and, and so many who change their appearances. I was watching Kate Winslet last night in a film called Ammonite. Mm -hmm. And she's such a beautiful woman, but you would not recognize this is the same girl. She, she let herself go. She put on some weight. Uh, it is not a vanity role at all. And she was completely in it. You could feel her pain as this character, <clears throat> who's a paleontologist, I think. Um, and her, her work with Schwarz the Roman was so immersed, uh, there was hardly any dialogue. It was all conveyed with feeling, with eyes, with touches. It was really astounding. I gotta see that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What, what made you get into voiceover work? Oh, I had uh, auditions, and that's how I got into it. <laughs> I, I had I had voiceover work in New York. You know, I, I did a lot of voiceover work. But when I came out here, they also had animation. So I got to audition for my very first cartoon role. And lucky for me, it was Rugrats. Yeah. Um, and that was my first. And then I, a year later, they showed us the pilot. And I was astounded to hear my mother's voice, because I was using my mother's voice come out of this thing with red hair. It was just a completely different part of me that I just orchestrated with my voice. They drew to voice. So all of us were watched in the booths, and when they animated, they tried to make it look exactly like us. Um, later in, in, uh, in animation's history, of course, electrodes are used on the face so that more and more of actors' bodies are being replicated it seems like a cheat, really, um, mm -hmm. by uh, uh, animatronics and, and audio and animation. Uh, animation is going through a lot of big changes right now. It's going to be very different in years to come. Yeah, you must be amazed, though, at how much uh, people love Rugrats. Oh, it's been wonderful. What a joy. Lucky me to be part of it. I had two roles on it, and I loved playing them. Um, and there was just a whole iconic history that went with it. I mean, I think it's still on in some places. I still get money, so it's still <laughs> on someplace. And, um, yeah, it was total joy. I got to work with such wonderful actors who were doing voiceovers for this, like the late Jack Riley. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cheryl Chase, of course, was the only young child on Rugrats who could go between the parents and the young kids. We couldn't understand what the babies were saying, but she could. So she's kind of the go-between and was in the booth with us sometimes with Jack Riley and me, uh, or Michael Bell, who played um, Minka's husband, Moose, Moose from the old country. And he also played Stu, uh, I'm sorry, Drew, Stu's brother. Mm -hmm. uh, he played lots of parts. So Michael Bell and Jack Riley and I got to work with Angelica or Cheryl Chase from time to time, but not often. Mostly we worked on our own, just the adults on the booth, and then later the, the babies would be in the booth. Yeah, I met E.G. Daly f about five years ago at uh, the horror convention Monster Palooza in Burbank, and she was just uh, the loveliest person. I said to her, my name is Tommy, and she said, oh, that's my name. <laughs> yeah, that's my son. I'm very proud of her. She's very beautiful. She sings beautifully. Oh. I first seen her in a play called uh, T-Neck Tansy, which was about a female wrestler, mm -hmm. uh, which was done at the... <clears throat> Oh, at the Whiskey A Go Go, I think, uh, 20 years ago. She was amazing in that. She was a wrestler, she was a singer, she was a dancer, she was an actor. Oh, she could do it all. I'm very proud of my little boy. 
Yeah, she she's a uh, she's a master thespian and uh, just a, a talented person. She can uh, do it all. It's it's amazing, you know. Um, it's a very hard industry, but you know she's such mm. such a, a great person. Yeah, gorgeous too. Just adorable and a great mommy. Yes, and you know, she can change her hair color or make it long or short, and you know it's her. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's magic. I've heard you say you thought the humor on uh, Weird Science was misogynistic. Oh, it was very sexist, yes. I um, I played the mom for a couple of seasons, and I had to balk at some of the writing. I just wouldn't say some of the things they said, I should say. But um, I thought it was, if you'll forgive me, vulgar. Yeah. I love the actors on it, but I thought the writing was a bit vulgar, and it really pandered to the worst aspects of teen boys, I felt. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm a feminist, uh, you know, I don't have to say feminist anymore because it's becoming more inculcated in the culture that women have equal positions and rights. I mean, I've seen so many amazing changes just in the last five years, you know, partly because of Black Lives Matter, more women getting, women of color getting into office. Uh, oh, it does my heart good, you know, it really does my heart good to see this. Um, certainly having a female vice president for me, is going to be wonderful. I love it, she, yeah. I, I gave her money. I went and heard her at a, a rally uh, a year ago. I'm very excited. And she's a good California prosecutor, which may, uh, you know, scare some people, but I don't think she'll bring her process, prosecutorial nature into the administration with Biden because he's a peacemaker. Yes. And uh, whether we like it or not, I think we're going to have more peace interstitially in America in years to come. There, my liberal nature is showing, but there, I've said it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm known for, you know, uh, occasionally being vulgar and, and telling dirty jokes and what have you and stuff, right? But I've been praised as, as being a feminist, and I, I am. I, I'm a huge supporter of women. I love the fact that there's more opportunities for them coming. Now we need a statue. Do you know that there's not one female monument in this country? Yeah, I, I, and so, I, I didn't realize that until you just brought it up, but you're right. A number of us are beginning to politics for a Ruth Bader Ginsburg statue in Washington. It would be the first. But there should be an Eleanor Roosevelt as well. I mean, it's just uncanny. Um, you know, it's wonderful to go to Washington uh, last year and see the beautiful monument to Martin Luther King. Uh, it's so tender and gorgeous. And the tour guide that we had in Washington told us that the Martin Luther King character is looking across at an Eleanor Roosevelt tribute. I don't think it's a monument of her, but it's looking toward the area where she is celebrated. So that made me feel good. It's a beautiful statue if you ever get to go to Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is really a gorgeous place. And in that rotunda where so much violence occurred on yeah. January 6th. Yeah. Um, it's such a hallowed hall. <clears throat> it's such a place where you feel the intentions of the uh, framers of the Constitution. You feel the honorable nature of their devotion and integrity and in trying to keep this dream of democracy together. It's just a... I can't imagine anyone violating that, hall, that, that room, that beautiful room with such, you know, such violence and such disrespect for the 200 plus years that we've lived by these rules. Uh, it's just very disheartening. I'm sorry I'm being so political, but it's very much all around me right now. Oh. It's very hard to distract myself from what's going on. Oh, that's How when do you air your show, Tommy? Is it going to be uh, very soon or much later? I, I always upload um, immediately after the, uh, after the interview's been done and stuff. Um, oh, well, good. It'll be timely, and maybe I'll be assassinated in the street when I go outside my house. I don't know. No, you won't. I just, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I won't, yes. I just had to say that because it's such a tumultuous time, and we all so much, well, we that I know, want unity and, and peace and equal rights for all and equal respect for everybody. Absolutely. So here's hoping. Yes, I just hope our 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 jokes and the political correctness thing will will go away at least because I missed that about about comedy. <laughs> I know it's certainly not as loose as we used to be, is it? 
No. Oh my God. I, 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 re, I remember just, you know, back in the day, you know, I've been watching old Saturday Night Live clips from like the late 70s, early 80s on YouTube. And it just, I missed that kind of humor, you know, of just, you know, uh, women victimizing men, you know, in the sketches. <laughs> oh, I love that part. But yeah. I saw someone, a girlfriend sent me this um, short piece of film from the 60s, I think it was. I'll just run this by you. Mm -hmm. Because there may have been a time when we all thought this was hilarious, I have to say. In another head, I could imagine me laughing about this. But it was like, a, not a candid camera show, but it's some sort of show where... Um, a young woman was brought out, and she was shown two handsome, hunky guys sitting on stools, yeah. and she was asked to choose between kissing them, one or the other, and would she mind kissing them? And yeah. she said, oh, no. So they blindfolded her, and the two men walk out, and they bring out two chimps, and they put them in the chairs. And uh, the girl's blindfolded, and, and they said, okay, spin around. Which one do you want? And she pointed to the right. She went to the chimp on the right, who was a, a kisser, and they, they start nuzzling, and, then, and it starts kissing her. And then um, she backs away, and, the, and the, the host says, well, how was that? And she said, it was different, very surprising. And the woman said, did, did you like it? And she said, yeah, it's really wonderful. And then she said, take off your blindfold. And when this girl saw that it was a chimp, she was really horrified, and I was horrified to think, you know, we think of germs, and we think of bestiality, and... Yeah. <laughs> like by today's standards, it was really horrifying and shock, shocking, and I wanted to sort of sue the people that did this, although they may all be gone by now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they brought out another, she was a very good sport about it, that girl, and then they brought out another young woman did the same thing with the two, two hunky guys, and she chose the other one and, and again, nuzzled with a chimp, and uh, the chimp faces were hilarious because he was doing like, you know, mugging and making big wide mouth and laughing and laughing and then kissing her. And and then when she was asked to remove her mask, you could see that she was ill and horrified. And then it was not funny, I don't think, for anybody there anymore. Yeah. But those are the kind of tricks, you know, that we all thought were funny. And now we can't stomach. I know. It's, 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 yeah. a, it's a weird time for comedy. You know, going back to what I was really? saying... What I was saying before, you know, about that quote that Ann said, you know, I'm, I I had Ann on the show a few months ago, and, you know... I heard, yes, I heard. Oh, you heard it? Thank you. Oh. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Loved, I loved talking to her about the classic Saturday Night Live stuff, you know, but I was just shocked at how, you know, PC she is now, because, you know, she was a very edgy, irreverent writer back in those days, you know, and it's just yeah, it's sad. Yeah, Rosie Schuster, both. Rosie Street Schuster. Writer, Saturday Night Live. And uh, who was the other one? Uh, Marilyn something? Yeah. And Meryl Marco? No, no, no. Uh, Marilyn. I think Marilyn Michaels or something. I think she was Lauren's wife or something. I don't know. Um, uh, no, Lauren's wife was Rosie Schuster. Okay, there there was a, a third girl named Marilyn on the show. But oh, well. I forget her last name. I forget her last name. But yeah, I mean, it's sad, you know, when people of that generation are conforming to the PC culture now, you know, it's it's like, it's like, it's not, it's not in their heart to do uh, what, whatever it is they're doing now, you know. Well, we look at comedy now and it's become a whole other art form. Uh, Panic Gatsby, for example. It's not a funny show. It was a very troubling show, uh, her statements about the persecution of females and her experience. Dave Chappelle, oh, he's one of my favorites. His shows have gotten pretty serious. And certainly, um, oh, who's the wonderful guy? He's a writer. Patton Oswald. I love him. Oh. <laughs> oh, how can you not? He, uh, certainly after his wife passed, he turned a corner and got more serious. Um, but there's a tendency now in stand-up, except for... Jerry Seinfeld will always be the great monologist. Yes, he will. <laughs> um, to begin to bring moving portions into it. It feels like comedy is morphing in some way. You can't go as crazy and risque as you used to, at least not right now. I don't think that Dave Chappelle's trans bits would go over quite so well in the year to come. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be a very different comedy, and I'm looking forward to being part of it, seeing how it how it evolves. I can't wait to see what happens next in that art form. Yes, we shall see. Yeah. So, Melanie, I have this secret silly game that I like to engage with guests in. And uh -oh. 
Oh, it's it's fun. It's fun. It's a series of silly slumber party questions. And oh. how it works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question and I answer it. Okay, but you know the answers. Well, I don't know your answers, but I know mine. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, clearly. You have the advantage. Okay, let her rip. And you can um, comment on answers. Do I win something if I get it, my answers right? No, we're just, uh, we're just relating, yeah. having fun. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, I will buy a copy of your book, so that's a prize right there. <laughs> oh, well, I want everybody to buy a copy. It goes on sale February 2nd. You can download the Audible now. I narrate it myself. And, um, and the, e- the e-book is also up right now. The book itself won't launch until February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Um, and the more folks that buy it in the very beginning, the more elevation in the ranks I will get in the Amazon, you know, statistics. So yeah. thank you for buying it early if you can. Mm-hmm. All right, Tommy, let her go. Let's hear it. Okay. Melanie, are you ticklish? Yes. Yeah. Only from people I don't trust. <laughs> I mean, tickle is a matter of trust. Yes. You know, my husband can tickle me. It's not as bad as if a stranger did. Like Henny Youngman did that with me on a, live on television. I didn't like that very much. Oh. It's in the book. Yeah, that's why he said, take my wife, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yes, I am ticklish. I've been known to hit people in the groin. I'm that ticklish. You? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, what is your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. Mm, the eyes. The what eyes. is your favorite part of the body? That's a popular one. Mine is the belly button. Oh, you're weird. <laughs> I hear that all the time. Yes, I am yeah, weird. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> um, what color are your toes painted? Uh, same, oh, natural. Yeah. What would you say is your best personality trait? Kindness. I agree. Mm. And what about yours? What is your best personality trait? Um, I have this beautiful blend of empathy and no filter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then That's my f- good for your position as a talk show host. I've tried. Yeah, I think it's a it's a mm. great balance. And then my favorite question is: there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Mm. Stilton cheese. Yeah. And what about you? What what smell makes you gag? Uh, <laughs> um, if someone has dirty feet or, um, if, if someone passes gas. Mm, okay. Those sound like typical. The, the classics, as I call them. <laughs> and then, um, I got a couple jokes for you. All right. What did the elephant say to the naked man? I don't know. Man, how can you breathe through that thing? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> a lot of doesn't people hurt anybody. Doesn't hurt anybody's feelings. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people like that one. Here's a, here's a uh, here's a good feminist joke. You know the difference between a golf ball and a G spot? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> oh, what, what is the difference between a golf ball and a G spot? A man will spend twenty minutes looking for a golf ball. <laughs> yeah. Very good. I heard a kind of a spin on that one just the other day. Uh, uh, that that they, that some someone published that there had been a, an enormous uh, model of the clitoris made at some um, biology lab, mm-hmm. and the men still couldn't find it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I like that one. 
So do you, do you have any like upcoming projects that you hope to get made once uh, COVID is under control? Well, I'd love if my book was picked up to be a series of modern love um, escapades. Uh, modern love is the New York Times produced uh, video series based on the stories in the New York Times of modern love. So that would be my dream to have uh, some of these packaged because there's a lot of stories about a mature woman falling in love and dating online. And um, I think these are all quite entertaining to people of all ages. So that would be my dream. How, how, how did I'm also you... writing a, oh, I'm go also ahead. writing a book of Corona poetry that I've started writing since last March. Co- co- corona poetry. <laughs> yeah, some of it is kind of funny, and some of it's elegiac, and some of it will be stuff that everybody is thinking to themselves, so they'll recognize themselves. Oh God, that's going to be hilarious! How, how, oh, how did you how did you find the online dating experience? Because I never liked it. Oh, I think it's a means to an end, um, <laughs> and I don't think uh, people enjoy it unless they meet the person. They're on their last first date, which is like Sandy Weiner's show uh, discusses. Everybody wants to be on their last first date. Um, I tried to make play out of it, just enjoyed meeting the people without any big expectations. I found that it was very important, if there was chemistry uh, emotionally on the phone, to -hmm. meet very quickly so you wouldn't go into fantasy land. There are people that have developed relationships on the phone before we had Zoom, uh, and they got very emotionally involved and then were shattered when there was no actual chemistry when they met. So... um, I had some bad experiences in terms of people not being what they said they were. Yeah. They had a lot more pounds, a lot more pounds and less hairs yep. on their head than they had proposed, a lot more, less inches in height than they'd said. I just did some drive-bys a couple of times and then called the guy later. Uh, you know, for example, I was supposed to meet a guy at a park on mm-hmm. a bench in a certain corner, and he was so unlike the photograph he sent me that I just drove by and then called him and left him a, a courteous message. Ugh. I didn't see any point in wasting his or my time. I yeah. didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings more than I had to. Uh, but I've become friends with a lot of the men I met online. Uh, they're good guys. They just weren't my guy. Uh, I have a story in my book called Le Cri de Cour, uh, in which I talk about meeting my husband online and all the weird complications that might have kept us apart that ended up bounding us, binding us together. Um, that's on page 151. Nice. I, I'm going I'm to yeah. read that story. Yeah, I, I didn't like the online dating experience. I met a lot of weird women, and the sex was terrible, and it was just... Mm. It was just not that. It was just not great, you know. That was during my bar days, and um, mm. yeah, I wouldn't want to go back to that. <laughs> it's it's too much. I had one experience where I, I met a man. I was starting to date him before nine eleven, and when nine eleven happened, we both felt as ex New Yorkers mm-hmm. like it was the end of the world, and I think it made us get a lot closer than we might have under ordinary circumstances. I think this happened with New York women and firemen, firemen who were the first responders in New York for the most part, became heroes. Um, And they got very emotionally involved with a a guy. And then when the world didn't come to an end, when New York didn't get totally bombed out, they realized they didn't have much to talk about. So um, that was kind of a a shock. And I think this guy and I similarly were so happy to have someone to hold hands with during this terrible time. that we went further into our relationship that we, than we might have under normal circumstances. It's just so interesting to look at how time and events change us. It you is. know, how we evolve, like that woman kissing the monkey thing, yeah. how we might have laughed at that once and can't now, and how we might have married a fireman right after 9-11 and then now would not want to be married to them. I, you have to watch it with your brain. It's just, uh, it molds and morphs, changes all the time. In terms of dating, you have to find someone you know you can go the distance with, that it's not a momentary, you know, attraction, that there's enough interest and uh, you you see that they cope well with tragedy or emergency. You follow them over a a length of time and know that this is something you can coexist with forever, as long as forever might last. Mm -hmm. Very well said, Melanie. So... Oh, thanks. uh, Absolutely. Odd Woman Out is available February 2nd on Amazon, and it's on, is it also available on your website? 
Yes, if they go to my website, they can click on the book cover and go right to Amazon. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I can't tell you again what an honor this is, Melanie. And I thank you so much for finally coming on. And I hope I, I lived up to everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Thank you, Tommy. Take good care, okay?